Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Quinney, and this is the Flames Face-Off brought to you by the Hockey Writers. This is a weekly show where we bring together some of our uh, best writers in the Calgary Flames writing pool, and we discuss all things Flames. Now, to be sure you don't miss an episode, you can subscribe to this YouTube channel. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, you can also like this video on Facebook and uh, YouTube. And be sure to share it with your friends. Um, and one of the things you won't want to miss is some of the great content that we have on thehockeywriters.com. So with that, let's uh, introduce our panel of writers. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Colton Pankew. Hey, Colton, how are you? Hey, Paul, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Really good, really good. Uh, and we have Brett Krause. Brett, welcome. Thank you, as always. Good to be back for another week. Great. Nobody's stolen those flame sweaters yet? <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> All right. Don't reveal your address. <laughs> and none, none other than uh, Mr. Greg Tosowski. Greg, welcome. How are you? I'm good. I'm enjoying uh, the weather and the, the snow is melting my backyard. So I can, uh, I like spring. Spring has sprung in Calgary, which is good. All right. I think it has across the country. Um, so let's, uh, let's get at it. So what happened last week? Well, the flames, uh, basically split their uh, two sets with uh, taking one from the Oilers and one from the Leafs. Um, but unfortunately, they've lost ground vis-a-vis -vis Montreal and Vancouver. And at 33 points, they're still four back of the Canadians. Um, two back, and they've got two games in hand. That's a concern. Um, they're two back of the Canucks who look like they're on a tear. And uh, assuming that you need 625, 65 points to get into the playoffs. Uh, that means the Flames will probably have to play 600 hockey or win two or three games. Not apparent, even under Sutter, that they can do that. So what's your take uh, on where they are at the end of this week? Uh, Colton, let's start with you. Yeah, I think all things considered, it wasn't a terrible I mean it was a pretty tough schedule I know Toronto's been struggling a bit lately but I think everyone's pretty much in agreement that they're the top team in the division um so I think getting one against them and the Oilers who have had a pretty good season too isn't a terrible week but given where they are in the standings right now it's it's not good enough they needed to I think get six points um hopefully they have two coming up against the Senators here so I think those will be crucial for them they've kind of struggled with Ottawa this year so they really need to pick those four points up yeah um, what about you, uh, Brett, any, any concerns or, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm fairly, fairly happy with the yeah. week for the guys. Um, I was kind of thinking two wins was, it was bare minimum, but, um, happy with it, uh, after this week, um, still time to turn things around. I mean, just looking at the standings. They only have one more regulation loss than the Oilers. So, you know, there's, there's still, I think there's still a fair amount of runway here, um, but they are running out of time to turn it around. And yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I think same with Colton, you gotta, gotta figure it out against Ottawa and, and pick up those points. All right. Greg, how are you feeling? Should uh, Calgary fans be worried or? Well, I'm not setting my hair on fire just yet because in the Sutter era, 2.0, as they say, um, he is four and two, which is winning, you know, two out of three games, which is what they have to do to try and get back in this thing. I'm a bit disappointed that they didn't gain any ground. I remember when we talked last week, you know, like those two Montreal games were like critical, you know, and they won both of them, you know, and it was, oh, great. You know, they're back on track. But then like Montreal has been actually picking up points. Even when they lose, I think they, they pick up points. It seems like, and I don't, I don't know what you guys did. I did not see Vancouver getting back into this, you know, like say two weeks ago, I thought, you know, those guys are buried and done. And, and now we've got Vancouver and Montreal to contend with to try and catch. But um, if the Flames can continue to win two out of three under Sutter the rest of the way, I think they're in, they're in they probably squeak in, but then who knows what will happen in the playoffs. But, um, you know, I'm not uh, too concerned just yet because I'm, but you're right about the, the Ottawa games. They, the Flames have been the weakest link, you know, in this division when it comes to taking points from Ottawa. And um, they have to get these two games. And, and, and I think 
with Sutter, you know, at the helm, I think he uh, he will get the most out of these guys against the weaker opponents, you know, like I said, because they have to show that they can get these points. And, and you know, like we said, must-win games for Montreal. Well, these are must-win games against Ottawa, just just to stay paced, to stay close to these guys. So Yeah. Well, you know, to your point, I guess the, uh, the other teams have to play 600 hockey as well. Yeah. Uh, to stay in the race. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I guess I was scratching my head. I mean, you, they played a good game against uh, the Oilers on Monday night, uh, solid effort. And then the next night, you got a blowout seven to three. They go into Toronto, play a really strong game there. And then uh, last night, while it was only a two nothing loss, uh, there were just lapses in their game. And I think if it hadn't been for the goal coast, the goalposts, uh, that game could have been a lot worse. Um, the Leafs got lucky. Um, I think Riddick should probably buy the, uh, I don't know, the goalposts, a steak dinner. Uh, I don't know what they eat goalposts, but. Uh, you know, I don't either, actually. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> the, um, but what, uh, I don't know. What are, you, what are your thoughts, Colton? Any, any, I guess what I'm saying is there's, have they erased the inconsistencies uh, based on what you've seen? Um, I, I mean, I, it's tough to say like that game against the Oilers, obviously I think seven, three final, which like Greg had uh, said, it's happened quite a few times this year where they've been on the wrong end of blowout defeats. I mean, you'd like to chalk it up to just it's Connor McDavid. Sometimes those games will just happen. Obviously he's one of probably the best player in the league. Um, but it, it seems to be happening so often. And I really was hopeful when they hired Sutter that that would kind of go away and obviously hasn't. And, and again, those games can happen. So it could just be a one-off, but it's concerning with how many times it's happened this year. Yeah. Yeah. Brett, uh, what's your take? Uh, am I making things up here regarding inconsistencies or uh, have they been erased or are you concerned at all? Uh, I don't think they've been totally erased, but I, I kind of thought that the Edmonton game was sort of multiple factors. I think there's a couple Markstrom really wants back, um, mm -hmm. and just small fixable mistakes. I think there was, you know, Lucic turned it over right to Connor McDavid over to Nugent Hopkins into the back of the net. Um, Michael Backlund, I think turned it over in the zone as they were, you know, trying to break out and dry sidle over to Dominic Cahoon into the back of the net. And so I, I think it's small details like that, which I, I <clears throat> think they looked better than they have in some of their blowout losses. I think it was just some small mistakes, um, not their best goaltending, and uh, just, of course, Connor McDavid being in a league of his own right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, Greg, speaking of, you know, Brett mentioned uh, blowout loss. And I know you've written an article on their blowout losses the last couple of years. It was a good piece. Uh, we'll get to it later uh, in the show. But uh, what are your thoughts on inconsistency as a theme? Is it uh, still part of the Flames uh, makeup? I think so. Well, it, I was actually surprised because, like, like I said, and like I wrote my piece, I was saying the Flames are going to lose games the rest of this way, but I didn't think they were going to have many of these, you know, blowout type losses under Sutter because it's with the accountability and the responsibility and the defensive play and the forechecking, backchecking, you know, just, I just didn't think, you know, we'd see a blowout loss like this right away, you know, just within the first, you know, a couple of weeks of Sutter taking the rain. So, I was a bit surprised to see it, but um, I think Brett is, is right. Like sometimes there are these games where it seems every mistake you make ends up in the back of your net. And like, sometimes you can play a sloppy game and still win it. You know, you could, your, your goalie bails you out or the opposing team can't finish, you know, on their ch big chances and stuff. So it, it might've been a combination of that. And Markstrom as well, like he didn't have his, his best game. And uh, although, he's been kind of hot and cold since he came back. So I don't know. He hasn't been really been the same since he had that thing, big collision, you know, on, uh, on the ice. And uh, he was, he was kind of had a few bad games and then he was six games uh, on the IR. So it was, um, you know, he hasn't been quite the same either. And, and I think if he kind of tightens his game up a bit, I think he'll help to like to fix those mistakes. Cause you, I think there's been, 
ad pieces written ad nauseum on the hockey writers about Kippersoff, how he kind of um, covered up for a lot of problems over the years that he was in Calgary, that uh, he would he would bail out the Flames. And uh, I was hoping that Markstrom would be kind of that similar goal. He could bail them out. And um, he did at the start of the year, but lately he's been kind of hot and cold and a bit inconsistent. So um, I think the Flames kind of go as he goes. I know there's a whole new system in place and a new sheriff in town, but if Markstrom can carry these guys and play a bit better, I think they'll be in good shape. Yeah. Well, speaking of hot and cold, um, I, I want to take a look at uh, or turn to Johnny and Monty, that show. Mm. Um, they've been missing in action, frankly. If you look at the last five games, I think Gaudreau is, he's, he's only got one point, Monaghan two. Um, you've got other players, uh, to Chuck and Lindholm. Uh, well, Lindholm's he's a point a game in the last five to Chuck four of four points in the last five games. Even Lucic has, uh, racked up more, more points, not much more than, uh, Gaudreau and, uh, Monaghan. So, uh, what's your take on what's going on with those two, uh, Colton, uh, can they cut it under Sutter? I, it's it's confusing because even last year you look those two really had off years and then to start this season I know Monaghan wasn't scoring much but their point totals through especially Goudreau it looked like he was really having a strong back and um, yeah I don't know since then it's just kind of went back kind of to what it was last year I, I do think that they'll be able to get back on track obviously like you said one point in five games for Goudreau he'll he'll snap out of that but it it is concerning and uh it needs to obviously turn around right away if they want to play that six hockey like you're, like you're saying they'll have to down the stretch. Yeah. Brett, what's your take? Uh, I mean, they're the, those two are the subject of so much commentary on, uh, you know, the so, on social media. Mm -hmm. um, what would uh, – are they on the trading block if, if as Facebook demands? Uh, well, uh, hard to say. Like they, they do go through – I mean, all players go through hot and cold streaks, but um, – you know, even after our talks about them, the line blender and all this, I'm I'm kind of thinking they should maybe split up Goudreau and Monaghan for a while. Um, okay. I think maybe like put Goudreau with Lindholm and Kuchuk, Kuchuk or something like that. Because um, Monaghan has started to look just very one dimensional to me. He doesn't doesn't offer a whole ton outside like he's a unbelievable goal scorer he leads his draft class in goal scoring yep. right now mm -hmm. over his career um but he doesn't really move the needle on much other aspects of the game that's like noticeable um so i think and you know saddled with simone and brett ritchie and you know all these other guys i think goudreau could really use a guy like kachuk they have right there who can play along the boards and is you know, an, an elite player. He's a top six player. And so I, I think they do, they should try something different because I think the Goudreau and Monaghan pairing hasn't been doing well for the, m more than a season and a half now anyway. Yeah. Well, I don't know. What, what are you, you, what's your thinking, Greg? Um, you know, Brett uh, touched on something there, breaking uh, Monaghan and Goudreau up. Um, would you do that? Or is there anyone from the taxi squad you can bring up? I thought it might've been Richie, you know, he's a big physical player. Mm -hmm. uh, he could uh, bang and crash on the four check and uh, have opposition uh, teams cough the puck up. Um, what's your take? Would you, would you put them on different lines or add someone to, to them? To yeah, them you know, it's with, Monahan, he's, I agree with Brett in, in the sense that he's becoming a bit more one dimensional and uh, his bread and butter is like standing in front of the net and like he's got a great release, a great shot. He's a goal scorer, you know, he's a pure goal scorer. But if he doesn't do that, what is he? If he, if he doesn't put in 25 goals a year and, and currently he, he's on pace for maybe like, you know, 15 this year or something like that, or even in a shortened season. But if, if he doesn't produce, you know, these, uh, these, these numbers, then what is he, what is he, if he's not a goal scorer? And I kind of agree with the, with the tactic of maybe splitting these guys up just to, to see it because we, we are basing um, everything on past success. Like they've been over the past five years, they've been one of the best duos in the NHL for, for point production, but how much of that has come in the last season and a half, you know, 
I don't think nearly as, as, as much, you know, that, that one year, 2018, 2019 was kind of high point for a, a lot of flames and it, those two included. So I have no problem with trying to shuffle things up. And I don't know if the answer is to bring someone on that line because they've tried, Colton has touched on this. They've tried a million different players with Johnny and Mon. What has worked? Well, pretty much nothing. And like Brett Ritchie's kind of a breath of fresh air to kind of a big guy on there to you know shake things up, but he's not really the long-term solution as we've talked about before. So, so you're right. I think uh, I think we should shake it up. You know, and I, I think that Daryl Sutter is also the guy to do it. He's not afraid to uh, hurt anybody's feelings and uh, and shake up these lines. So, like mm-hmm. I say, yeah, I say we 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 split split up those guys and see what they can do on different lines because. Uh, I think something has to change because, you know, their their goal scoring, their points in general, their goals for was worst in the in the division. And if they're going to get back in this race, you know, it, it can't just be in the back of all defensive play and forechecking, checking, back checking, responsibility, accountability. They got to score goals too, and they got to try something here. So, mm-hmm. well, do you think uh, Sutter is trying to send a message to those two? Because if you look at their ice time, it's down quite significantly, or am I imagining things is, is the other explanation rather that, Hey, you know, he's rolling four lines now. So they're just not getting as much ice time because of that. Uh, Colton, uh, any thoughts on that in terms of a shorter bench setters playing or who's getting less ice time is a message. Yeah. Person. I think just being um, still new to the team, obviously just six games in, I think he's still, probably trying to evaluate exactly what it is he has there. So I wouldn't look too much into it in terms of a, like a benching or a, a message being sent. I think he's just, I think he likes to roll his four lines and is still, yeah, just evaluating what he has. Yeah. Brett, do you see any messages being sent? I mean, last night it looked like uh, Dubé was riding the pine, as they say, because of that turnover uh, to Spezza uh, or, or as he, as Colton suggests, just seeing what he's got. Yeah, I definitely agree with Colton there. Um, I think in the press conference last night, you know, he said that there was just some players who weren't able to handle the way Toronto was playing in that second period, obviously referring to Dubé, but I don't think it's some sort of attack on Dubé. I think he was just, you know, he wasn't the right fit at that time in the the game. And um, I'm seeing lots, you know, just early on noticing a lot better line matching, you know, the guys on the flames that you want to see out there against the McDavid's and the Matthews are pretty much always out there against them. So I, I think he's just, yeah, like Colton said, getting a feel for what he's got, um, kind of where they fit and what role he wants to carve out for them, I think. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so let's switch gears a bit and uh, look on to next week. So next week, they've, uh, they're have they playing the Senators on Monday and Wednesday. And I think the consensus of the panel is that th- those should be uh, four easy points, easy picking. Although, that said, the Sens have beaten up the, oil, the uh, Flames and stolen their lunch money uh, a couple times this year. And then they move on to the Winnipeg Jets, which presumably is going to be a, a much tougher uh, set for them. Um, Greg, what what are you thinking? What are we going to see next week? Uh, what do we have to see next week? Well, you have to see two wins against Ottawa. Like they've already lost so many points um, to the, the other teams. I think uh, Edmonton has won all their games against Ottawa, yeah, and so you have to. Uh, you have to take those points. It's pure and simple. There's no no mincing words. As for Winnipeg, like again, um, the Flames at times um, have shown that they can kind of rise to the occasion. You know, like I, I think a lot of their over the past few years, I've noticed that people used to always say, "Oh, they're they're playing to the level of their competition," and that kind of might be why they, they were struggling against Ottawa because they don't seem to rise to the occasion against the the lesser teams or they seem to show up for the, the better teams. And so I'm thinking if, if they can get some momentum and, and, and take those two games in Ottawa, I'm, I'm thinking they're looking pretty good heading in, heading in, in, into Winnipeg. And, but they're no slouches. It seems right now, Toronto, Edmonton, Winnipeg have kind of been separating themselves as like the three that are going to, you know, I think are a lock for, uh, and now it's going to be Calgary, Montreal, and now Vancouver, who are just trying to battle it out for that fourth spot. So I'm, I'm thinking 
none of the games against uh, the Jets, Oilers, or Toronto are going to be easy this year. But I think I think I think the I think the Flames are are heading in the right direction. I think they they match up pretty well against uh, Winnipeg, especially with the new the new Sutter style of hockey, which they're purportedly trying to do the game in and game out. So, Colton, what are your thoughts on the keys to next week success next week for the Flames? Yeah, like we said, and Greg just touched on, I think the Ottawa games, you you have to get four points there. Um, heading into Winnipeg, I think Winnipeg is kind of the team in that division that doesn't seem to get talked about as much as the, obviously, the Leafs, and then even the Oilers as being one of the division's top teams. I think they're a really underrated team. So um, those would be a bit tougher. I think you, you're you looking to get one for sure against Winnipeg. I mean, obviously, they can get both. That's... That's ideal, but I think if you can get both against the Senators and pick up two points in those two games against the Jets, uh, that's a pretty good week for them. All right. Uh, Brett, your take on next week? Uh... Yeah, I think for sure four points against the Senators. Um, I'll be interested just to see if any differences now that with Daryl Sutter on the team now, um, how they handle that group. Um, and I think, yeah, they're they're gonna have to get their uh, offense going. I think here because Hellebuck's, you know, won the Vezina last year, and uh, he's an elite goaltender. So uh, you gotta you gotta have firepower and be able to get a couple past them. Um, I think this mm-hmm. week they they need to get their power play going again. Um, early on, it was great in the season, and it was really really beneficial to them, but. Um, it hasn't looked so good recently, and so I, I think they really got to get that going again here if they want to make a push down the stretch. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting point. You, you, you raise uh, Hellebuck. He's probably one of the best goaltenders in the league, uh, certainly in the division, and uh, they'll definitely need firepower, but that's the problem. I was looking at the stats this morning in Calgary. Uh, they've got 87 goals which puts them exactly on par with, guess who? The lowly Ottawa Senators. Uh, so, I don't know. We'll have to see uh, how they fare in Winnipeg. Um, the um, I wanted to switch gears, though, on a little bit on... Um, turn to some of the articles you guys have written. Uh, Colin, you wrote a good one on um, basically advising for living that he's should be trying to acquire uh, a Kyle uh, Palomari. Um, can you just recap that article for us and, uh, and, and say something about, you know, of all the um, uh, potentials out there, why him? Well, it was kind of going off of, uh, I'd seen Brett had put one out a few days before with some interesting names too. Like Ricard Raquel was one that I thought would be a really interesting one at a really reasonable cap hit too. I didn't realize he was only at 3.8 million, I think. But uh, Palmieri is just one I think isn't getting a ton of recognition. I haven't really heard his name out there much, but obviously the Devils are going to be selling. He's a free agent at the end of the season. I think he like we said, like they're struggling to score goals and throughout his career, I think the last four or five seasons, he scored 24 goals or more in all of them. Uh, last season, obviously in the shortened year, I think 25. And I think he would just be a good fit, especially on their power play unit as well. He has been really good there with the Devils for the last, I don't know how long he's been in New Jersey now, five years, I'd say. Um, he can play on the point on, on the wings. He's just a really good uh, shot first player that I think would slide in well to their top six and on their power first power play unit. Mm-hmm. Um, Brett, uh, you wrote an article. Well, actually, you gave Tre Living uh, six players that he he could consider, uh, but uh, Paul and Mary wasn't on the list. Uh, why didn't he make it? And why did you pick the six you chose? Um, to be honest, I wasn't I can't hadn't even really thought of uh, Paul and Mary. I um, was just kind of going off uh, the rumors that I had heard, like uh, the. Flames were noted by Elliot Freeman. They had made a call on Ricard Raquel. Um, the price was too high, and that's when they decided uh, to make a coaching change. And they had also been um, calling on uh, Nashville as well, but uh, that was the extent of the info that Elliot had. So I, I just kind of went off that. <clears throat> and a couple players, um, other players that I'd like to see, 
Um, I think uh, Troy Terry as well out of Anaheim. <clears throat> he's young and it was reported he's kind of a Sam Bennett situation. Career's not mm. off to the start he was hoping and might be looking for a change of scenery. Um, <clears throat> and uh, all those guys were right shots, of course, Paul Mary as well. Um, so I, I think it was just kind of trying to look at some difference maker options. I think Paul Mary is definitely one of them too. Uh, re- going through Col- Colton's article, he's, you know, I think he's the type of guy that could drive a Monaghan and Goudreau line. I think he's a, a skilled Brett Ritchie, basically. He's uh, six foot and hundred and some odd pounds and close to 200. And I think that's a guy who could work the corners and um, get them the puck. So I think there's options out there. It's just whether or not they want to pay the price. A skilled Brett Ritchie. I love it. Uh, Imagine that. <laughs> Greg, uh, what are your thoughts on Palmieri and uh, some of the others that, that uh, Brett was suggesting? Anything leap out at you? Anything you'd act on if you were for loving? Well, it, uh, in a regular year, I think he would be smart to, to try this. You know, it, but this, this crazy COVID-19 restrictions and the 14-day quarantine and all this stuff, it just puts a damper on everything. You know, it's just, you would, you would love to see, you know, them try something, even though Trilliving has recently said that he's not a big fan of rentals and everything, but, um, but um, I, I would love to see it. And like, I just recently read that Palmer article and, and I too hadn't really thought of him. And I think that's intriguing to me, you know, like uh, um, that's not a bad move. And if, if they could pull it off, that would be great. But I think they have to do it kind of sooner than later, because I don't think you can completely the longer you wait, you know, and then you get closer to the trade deadline and then you have the whole, you know, 14 day waiting period. So I think you, if you want to grab somebody, you should kind of get the deal done sooner than later. So you can get that out of the way because you, I don't think you really want to, to wait, you know, too close to the end of the year by the time the, the player gets into your lineup. So, but uh, of, of all those players, yeah, I, I hadn't also thought of Paul Mary. He kind of jumped out at me as well as maybe he'd be the fit that yeah. flames need because they, I think they need something like they've, they looked at their, you know, their taxi squad, they've shuffled lines, you know, like there's a bunch of AHL guys that we've talked about, but uh, do, you, do you really want to like try these AHL rookies, you know, at this point in the season, I think uh, maybe a proven guy like Paul Murray is the guy, you know, why not? I like it. Well, one thing's for sure. If he's going to, if he's going to pull a trigger on this, he's got to do it soon uh, mm-hmm. to, to, you know, with a 14 day quarantine and so forth. Um, I wanted to switch gears. Uh, we were talking about blowout, blowout losses. And Greg, I, I referenced the article you had written uh, six blowout losses in six weeks. The flames have a history of losing big um, recap that article for us, Greg, and uh, tell us uh, what's behind that. Why is that the case? You know, I didn't even really, really, I started doing the research when I, after they lost like six and six weeks, I started looking back on past seasons and um, I was a bit surprised to see that this trend kept going back year after year, with the exception of their one, you know, golden year where they went to the, where they were the top of the Western conference. I went, went back six seasons and they had, uh, you know, six years ago, they had 20 losses by three or more goals. And, um, and they've had a lot of coaches since then, you know, Bob Hartley and Glenn Gullitson, Bill Peters, Jeff Ward, Daryl Sutter had just had, had the most recent one. And, and the consistent, and what's consistent about all this is that there's this core group of guys like Goudreau and Monaghan and, you know, and Kachuk came in a, a year later and Giordano, of course, and, you know, there's this core group and yet they're still not getting the job done either. I don't know if they're not playing for each other. If it just, if this group is just not the right group, you know, because this these numbers don't really lie, and I and I said in my piece that this is probably the last bullet in Brad Treliving's chamber. Like, if this doesn't work, if if uh, Daryl Sutter can't get the most out of the, this group, this core group that's been you know getting these blowout losses handed to them year after year after year, you know, I think we we're we're going to see big changes. You know, you know, trade Johnny, you know, trade Monty, you know, do what you have to do to try, you know, Giordano, you know do what you have to do and kind of do kind of a rebuild and keep Kachuk, you know, and keep some of the younger guys, but you know, it's all, I think it's open season for this, yeah. for this, uh, for trades and for rebuilding after the season, if things don't turn around under Sutter. 
with this group. That's so that, that that's kind of the whole point. And I was a bit surprised at how many blowout losses this group has suffered for six seasons. So, mm. and uh, look out, look out if it doesn't turn around. That's my that's my theory. Brett, what's your take? Uh, is is there a tradition of blowout losses? Can Sutter stop it? And if he doesn't, um, I don't know. Are we looking at a new general manager possibly in, in Calgary? <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's hard to say. Like, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Um, I definitely think that, yeah, Greg's right. There's like, it's noticeable. If you're a Flames fan, you've noticed that there's nights where they are just awful. And, uh, yeah, I'm not sure you'd have to take a deep dive into each game to see, cause they just kind of look flat and they just collapse and nothing goes their way that night. Um, so I think there's, yeah, a lot of things, but, um, for sure, I think next season, uh, cause uh, surrounding this season, there's, there's a lot of factors into an unsuccessful season and, you know, we don't know how <clears throat> the guys are, you know, mentally doing outside of hockey as well. There could be other things going on there. Um, so I think next season, if, you know, all goes well regarding COVID and everything, and we can kind of get back to something normal. I think next season's a big, big measurement test for a lot of people's jobs. And who knows? Cause uh, I'm not really sure who is kind of would be firing Trey living if it's coming straight from ownership. Um, but yeah, I think it it could, if next season kind of goes this same way, there could be a big, big changes, I think. Hmm. I don't know, Colton, what, uh, what are your thoughts? I know we're switching gears a little bit, but uh, is, is Trillidin's, uh job on the line? If things like yeah. losses don't stop, man. Yeah, I, I kind of thought about writing something on it the last few weeks here. It's it's interesting because I think throughout his tenure, it was kind of the same thing. Like the that Maybe not the inconsistencies as much during the regular seasons, but by the time it would come to playoffs, it was always, is this team – built for the playoffs like should there be bigger changes and I think he's made some pretty good moves in his tenure here I like I don't mind the roster even heading into this season I expected them to be quite a bit better so I like we said we we're all trying to figure out what exactly is wrong with this group it's it's a tough thing to like, figure out I guess but at the end of the day he's been there I think now for six years or so and seven, it's kind yeah. of been seven yeah it's kind of been the same thing over and over so like Brett said, I do think just because of how odd this whole year is with COVID and everything, I, I do think he'll get a chance again next year. Um, but if it's anything like this again, then I'd say that he's probably gone for sure. Back in bags. Okay, gentlemen, as always, uh, great discussion, but we've run out of time. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us for this week's edition of Flames Face Off. Um, in the meantime, we'll see you next week. But in the meantime, uh, to make sure you don't miss an edition, uh, you can subscribe to this YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, like, a, like this video on uh, YouTube and Facebook. And be sure to share what, you, uh, what we've put out here with your friends. We'd appreciate it. And be sure to uh, check out the hockeywriters.com, uh, particularly on Monday Mondays when we uh, publish the uh, Flames Weekly, which will give you a nice recap of everything that happened to the Flames in the previous week and a look forward. And uh, be sure to check out the uh, great content that we've got at the hockeywriters.com. Until next week, take care. <laughs>